Welcome back, my gentle and modern apes. It's 2020, we're about midway through the year, the summer solstice is behind us, and winter looms ahead. The temperatures are rising, and social tensions are rising right along with them, but we can indeed take solace in the few constants that we have in our world. When we get up tomorrow, the Earth will still be spinning, gravity will hold us close to the planet, and creationists will still be spouting tons and tons of nonsense. And sometimes, they're committing said nonsense to the written word. If you're like me, and you're in your early to mid-twenties, maybe even your late twenties, you probably remember the excellent masterpiece of a show that is Avatar The Last Airbender. This show featured in its world a lost library that was helmed by a spirit known as Wan Shi Tong. He looked like this big owl monster, and inside this library he had all of the books of the world. It, it essentially contained the knowledge of this plane of existence, all in one single ethereal place. It was basically like this ghost library of Alexandria, but in the world of Avatar The Last Airbender. If you haven't seen the show, I do recommend checking it out. Anyways, I've always kind of wondered what happened to the books that don't actually make it into Wan Shi Tong's library? What about the books that don't contribute to the knowledge of the world? I like to imagine they end up in a library all their own. A library of errors. This kind of library would have been very empty in ancient times, just because literacy was scarce and the ability to write was even scarcer. But in our modern world, the library of errors is just booming. I like to imagine that it's probably guarded by some ghoulish gibbony spirit, a, a simian soul that, I don't know, makes like YouTube videos about which books are allowed to grace the shelves of the library of error. I guess that's where I come in. Today I, the self-proclaimed Simeon Keeper of the Library of Errors, will be introducing you to the first of our accredited inhabitants. Why Human Evolution is False by Creationist YouTuber Standing for Truth. <laughs> Before we begin, go ahead and like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell to get the, you know, the notifications and all that jazz. Also, this channel now has merchandise associated with it. You can get all sorts of Gutsick Gibbon related stickers and t-shirts and water bottles and stuff like that from Redbubble and Teespring with the links in the description. There are also other just kind of nerdy stickers and things of that nature that you can buy um, if you're a big dork like me and want to profess your love for paleontology and anthropology and zoology, etc. to the world. So you can purchase those and help out the channel if you so desire. So this review, these reviews, as I do intend on <laughs> making it a series, is going to be pretty freeform. I'm going to be pretty organic about how I kind of tackle the text, um, and I'm going to be pretty honest with my interpretation. So hopefully standing doesn't take any of this too hard. I like standing as a person, um, but I very much disagree with the things that he has to say uh, with regard to science and origins and, and things of that nature. Um, and those things are recapitulated in this book. A lot of what you see at his channel is like this is just the text version of that. So I figure we could just kind of start with first impressions and then really work our way through it. We're only going to go to about chapter, end of chapter one today, and then we're going to kind of digest it in chunks uh, so that we can really, we can really let it ferment in our brains, really mull it over and give it our full attention. Because Standing has clearly put a lot of work um, into this book. So first impressions, um, it's not that big. It's a pretty small book, actually. Um, the text is probably like 200-ish pages, 190-something, um, I believe. Uh, and the font is huge. That was the first thing that I noticed when I kind of opened it up. I actually was, I like called my fiancé down and I was like, this text is ridiculous. It took me about um, an hour and a half to read and annotate, um, which just isn't that long. I, I suppose that does, in a positive way, speak to the... Um, digestibility of the content like it's it's fairly easy to read there's not a lot of not too much jargon or anything in there um 
but this is also supposed to be a book that's like overturning conventional science like in its entirety so you would think that it would be like a little bit longer for reference i have behind me on this shelf that i'm reaching grasping out to it's, it's over here so here it is charles darwin's oh dang it I'm dropping things all over the place charles darwin's seminal work uh on the origin of species um and this book has like literally <laughs> like two size font i mean it's probably more like nine uh, but very small font and it's like 550 pages um and a huge chunk of the latter half of the book is just references um, so if you're going to overturn conventional science maybe you want to pay a little bit more attention to uh to your reference list because the reference list if we go right to the back i'm gonna let you guys know ahead of time the, the reference list is quite short and it's got a lot of hyperlinks so this is page one of the reference right there um and then there's literally like a little bit on the next on the next page so, you know, if, if you're going to be making such groundbreaking claims, you probably want to do a little bit better with regard to that. But but we're going to go into this. We're going to go into this with, you know, with with some very uh, open minds. Let's say that we're going to go into it with open minds. All right, so we'll start with the back. We'll, we'll read our little blurbs in the back here. So Standing for Truth says that he is the man behind Team SFT, the YouTube channel, and the creation ministry. He has authored the book Universal or Separate Ancestry, the biblical model of origins made easy. In addition, he has also co-authored several books with creation apologist Raw Matt. Yes, Raw Matt was also involved in this book. Um, so we're going to be talking about Raw Matt in a minute too, because I have a lot to say about Raw Matt at this particular moment in time. SFT has been studying creation and evolution for years and has gained a significant following on YouTube. He has joined forces with Raw Matt to help win the war against the philosophy of evolutionism. Your alarm bell should be going off right there. Evolutionism is not something that even the creationist scientists in the field are, are like using. Um, they have been also working together since 2017 on formulating an irrefutable model of biblical ancestry. SFT is no stranger to debates in defending biblical creation. He has had well over 50 live debates, including debates with many well-known proponents of evolution, PhD biologists, and serious students of evolutionary theory. I hope I'm considered to be one of those serious students. SFT and I have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe, um, several times, so I like to think that this is like a shout-out to me. Um... He's been interviewed many times over various YouTube channels and podcasts and has himself interviewed some of the world's most well-known young earth creationists. That's actually true. I have seen Standing um, kind of pick the brains of the likes of, uh, you know, uh, Anderson and some of those dudes. Um, and then his main blurb. So that was like about the author. So we'll talk about the main blurb now. This is very dramatic. So I'm going to read it in a dramatic voice if, if that's copacetic with the audience. Not that you have any choice in the matter. This is pre-recorded. There exists a concept that has captured the minds of countless individuals for years. This is the idea that humans have evolved from an ape-like ancestor millions of years ago. This outwardly ridiculous notion has turned countless people away from the truth of human origins. Do humans really share a most recent common ancestor with a chimpanzee? Or do all humans today descend from just two people, Adam and Eve, 6,000 years ago? Why Human Evolution is False, the scientific case for independent origins, presents an irrefutable case against ape-to-man evolution using top-level arguments and the most up-to-date research available. Put a pin in that one, folks. The author of this book, Standing for Truth, challenges all the proponents of human evolution to counter this incredibly compelling arguments and lines of evidence presented in this book. He is in, sorry, extremely confident that the scientific evidence presented in this colossal game changer cannot be refuted. The extraordinary and undeniable evidence presented in this must-read book has massive implications. The data offered not only invalidates human evolution fairy tale, the human evolution fairy tale, but also confirms biblical creation and a literal Adam and Eve. So we've got a lot of big ass claims on the back of this book. Let's 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 like let's redux some of them just just to really let that sink in so that we can go in knowing um, that the, the the severity of the claims does require a, a close look. These are these are uh, this is big. We've got irrefutable most up-to-date research available. We have challenges all proponents of human evolution to counter this incredibly compelling list of arguments and evidence. 
He is extremely confident that this scientific evidence presented is a colossal game changer and cannot be refuted. So I, of course, am taking this as an open challenge, um, which is why we're we're going to we're going to be very systematic in our in our investigation. Um, so let's go ahead and get started, shall we? So we begin the text with some dedications and acknowledgments. So just so you can see it, um, it's generally pretty nice stuff. SFT just you know talks about how understanding that Genesis is the foundation for his faith is really important. Um, without faith, it is impossible to please God, things of that nature. Um, great, all fine and dandy. I, who am I to tell people how to believe? Um, I, I simply am here to comment on the bad science. But then we have the foreword. Now, this, the foreword in this text is written by uh, Raw Matt, who is one of Standing for Truth's, um, I guess you would say, like, co-channel creators. Raw Matt is a guy who hangs out on Standing for Truth's channel and helps make videos for, for you know, the entire organization at large, Team SFT, as they like to call themselves. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read some of Raw Matt's intro, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what Raw Matt has been up to as of late. So in Raw Matt, I'm just going to read some, some portions. We have been doing this knowing we have had critics, and we have ensured that we developed and sought out the very best arguments to counter our critics. The information gathered throughout this thrilling adventure is presented in this book for the world to see. This book is extremely well sourced and the evidence is the best to date. I am no layman when I speak these things. Um, Ramat then proceeds to give some of his credentials. I am not only a creation apologist and a member of Team SFT, that is to say the SFT Brain Trust, I am a gerontologist, a microscopist, microscopist I guess you would say, uh, author, lecturer, ordained minister with a doctor in divinity. I am also certified in every known system of herbalism worldwide and supplement formulator for Marcus Rothkrantz's Body Force Products line. I am proud to acknowledge that we have built the largest Young Earth Creationist team on YouTube. That's comforting to me as someone who's a big fan of science um, and conventional science in general, that, that SFT's kind of channel is the largest one to date. But let's appreciate Ramat's claims here. A gerontologist, someone who studies, I guess, old people, aging, something along those lines. Um, he claims that the book is the best, extremely well sourced, and the best, most up to date uh, kind of kind of tome on the subject of human evolution. So we're we're really going to be investigating that. We're going to be looking at all of the papers, very in depth. It's going to be great. Um, but there's been some drama with Ramat lately. I'd like to share it with you, if I may. Raw Matt has, um, oh gosh, how do I put this? This is delicate because I'm not trying to, like, get sued for libel or something. Raw Matt essentially has been claiming that he's he's a published author with regard to, to some of the, the titles that he has um, kind of attributed to himself in this in this text here. And he's been saying this for, for quite some time, to my knowledge. So very recently, uh, himself and some of his ilk, I might say, uh, have have been passing around a link to one of his papers. It's like about mutation rates with regard to Noah's flood, the Noachian deluge. And uh, one of those papers, one of those links leads to like a PDF of, of the paper itself uh, with <laughs> PLOS 1 like watermark on the top. Now, if you know anything about PLOS 1, they're a pretty good journal. So, you know, myself and some of my, some of my comrades were perplexed by this. We saw that and we were like, okay, I've I very much doubt that PLOS One published raw mat on this, um, and and once we looked into it, it became very clear that that this particular watermark was placed there fraudulently, uh, along with a fake DOI for for its basic for when it was published. So th this is the kind of guy that raw mat appears to be. Um, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. It's very hard for me to mentally reason around putting a fake watermark on a paper. Um, a, a paper, I guess you would even say, since it wasn't actually, to my knowledge, published in any journal. Um, maybe it was, correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. Um, but, but that's kind of the, that's kind of the, the breed that we're dealing with, with regard to raw mat. Standing has done none of those things to my knowledge. Um, but, you know, he's got raw mat on the, on the gang. One bad apple spoils the bunch, some say. So, um, yes, let's continue. Uh, raw mat moves along in his foreword. He's, he's very much, uh, like, inflating Standing for Truth, talking about how smart they all are, 
Um, and and I don't doubt that some of that they have knowledge in certain areas. Human evolution, as you will see based off of this text, is not really one of those areas. Uh, there's some shilling for their for their channel and for their their merch store. I am I am excited for this book to be in your hands. SFT is going to share with you and expose the myth of human evolution. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure the, how the composition of that sentence works. Standing for Truth is going to share with you and s expose the myth of human evolution. So I guess sharing just the text as a whole with us um, and expose the myth of evolution. It is the one area evolution has the largest problem with, yet pretends to have it all figured out. They tell the public that it flows perfectly, but they couldn't be more wrong. They peddle lies as truth far before the actual evidence is even in and do not understand even the vaguest concept of what our history was truly like. So, okay, uh, we're, we're going to get to all of like the actual proposed <laughs> refutations and evidence that they're presenting here, but right off of the bat, the, 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 the syntax and the kind of word structure and just in general, like, like the prose itself is is a little bit subpar for what you would expect for for a book that's supposed to be overturning all of conventional science. However, they need to sell their story and pretend the myth is true at any cost, or else government grant money runs out and jobs are lost. Ah uh, yes, big evolutionary biology, known for just raking in the cash. Do not think for even a second that educators are in control of what they teach or that scientists do not have incentive to find evidence for the theory. So without further ado, sit back, buckle up, because you are in for one heck of a ride through biblical history. Um, I really wish that he'd said one hell of a ride. I think that would be uh, that would have been real badass to have in your book. Um, but, but we're going to go ahead and jump into the preface next. But before we do so, let us go ahead and sum up a bit of what we've covered and learned so far, mostly with regard to Ramat. He's making several grandiose claims. He's backing them up with, with various titles. Um, and we know off to the side that Ramat has kind of fraudulent, fraudulently claimed that he is has been published in PLOS 1 um, and has since been busted and put put out a retracted version, retracted that, uh, that PLOS 1 watermark. Uh, we still do have it pictured here, but who am I to, who am I to, like, beat a dead horse? Others have already done so. You can find some videos doing so in the description below. So we'll go ahead and move on from the preface, or rather, from the foreword to the preface. This book is the outcome of years' worth of intense study. This intense study comprised both sides of the argument. It was my objective to understand evolution even better than the proponents of evolution themselves. I have analyzed both creation and evolution very comprehensively. It has been my mission to make myself as up-to-date on the scientific data as possible. We will see about that. You will see throughout this book, as I have as I dismantle the absolute best evidence evolution has to offer. In addition, you will observe that this book is not just refutation of human evolution, it is the overturning of it in favor of a much stronger and evidence-based model. Then he talks about his other book, um, Universal or Separate Ancestry, The Biblical Models of Origins Made Easy. One way I have guaranteed that I would create an irrefutable book on these very topics was to engage with the opposing side as much as possible. That's true. Standing and I have, like I said, had many conversations um, about that, about various topics of human evolution. Um, I don't personally think any of them had any, like, overturnings. Most of the overturnings that he proposed were themselves done by creationists um, and were rejected by the scientific community at large for poor methodology. If you are a proponent of human evolution and universal common ancestry, it is my hope that you will carefully consider the arguments and the evidence presented in this book. I plan to do exactly that standing. Don't worry. By the way, I'm not necessarily re I'm not reading everything. I want to give you some incentive to go out and buy the book if you would like to kind of delve further into it. I'm reading paragraphs that I've kind of annotated and highlighted as uh, particularly important. Um, and then he talks a little bit about how much time he's put into it. Endless hours bringing you all the best evidence for biblical creation and against evolution. I only ask that you consider the evidence presented. And consider we will, standing. This brings us to chapter one. Introduction. Ape to man evolution. Starts off with a, a chapter in Genesis. 
And then some commentary on that chapter. The Bible claims to be the history book of the universe, and the first chapter of Genesis describes the creation of mankind. God tells us man was created in his own image out of the dust of the ground. Nowhere do we see so much as a hint of any type of ancestral relation to apes. Um, so we can see where his foundation is at this point. Uh, this this is kind of the linchpin of many creationist arguments. They, uh, they start with the conclusion and they work backwards from there. That's basically the hallmark of bad science and, and of a bad study in science. And if you read anything on methodology, on, on creating a study, um, on creating a research paper, whatever, or a project, that's like one of the things that they really ward against. I actually have a book right out of screen called um, Studying Primates. It's by uh, Setchell, um, Joanna M. Setchell. And very much wards off um, ideas about about like basically p hacking and doing all all sorts of those kinds of things. Going conclusion first, hypothesis second. It's just bad practice. So more um, biblical over Bible verses here. Um, quickly too, not not all Christians are like down with standing's interpretation it's very easy to fall into the trap when you're looking into creationism that uh aig and icr and creation.com and, and you know the big boys the alpha chads of creationism like to present which is that it's god's word versus man's word the irony being that it's man's word versus conventional science because they're ver they're they're not dealing with the the tried and true like universally accepted interpretation of the Bible, they're going with one single interpretation that happens to favor a young earth. If you look into the works of John Walton, um, I, I believe some of like the early saints, St. Saint Augustine, um, Origen, some of those guys who are very much into the idea that Genesis is allegorical, you'll find that faith can seat quite comfortably next to conventional science and indeed the theory of evolution in the age of the earth. Um, Sorry, you guys are going to hear that beeping sometimes. That's like my alarm. People are coming in and out of the house. Um, it happens. What are you going to do? So, some more Bible verses. Um, basically trying to defend a, a literal interpretation. Of course, these verses are presented in English, not the original Hebrew. Um, so, I, I, might, I might guard against that as well. Does the scientific evidence tell us we descend from a literal Adam and Eve thousands of years ago? No, it doesn't. Genesis 2 describes the creation of man and woman. The historicity of Adam and Eve is also substantiated by Jesus Christ. If the account of human origins as recorded in the Bible is true, we should be able to test these claims with modern scientific data. We should also make retrodictions and predictions that are testable. This book will demonstrate without a shadow of a doubt that modern science and the advances in the scientific community do in fact back up the biblical model of creation. I've never heard without a shadow of a doubt before. I've heard beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, but these are the kind of things that you would want, you know, like your editor or something to correct. Um, were, were you publishing in something major? Um, a dangerous game that you could play if you wanted to die at home would be to take a shot every time there there is a confidence claim. You would be doing so at your peril. Next, we have some more, um, kind of some more talk about how you can't be like a legitimate Christian unless you accept uh, biblical creation as it is presented in this text. Um, AIG likes to take that stance as well. Um, there are a great many scientists and indeed theologians out there that would disagree with that who interpret Genesis with a little bit more, I guess, uh, nuance is how I would put it. So let's continue. Does the scientific evidence suggest we are related to apes, or do all humans descend from just two ancestors, Adam and Eve, in, not, in the not-so-distant past? What evidence do proponents of human evolution use to demonstrate their belief in ape-to-man evolution? Does any of this evidence have any real validity to it? This handbook on everything human evolution will answer these questions and more. Many of the fossil record-related record arguments found in this book have been the result of the amazing work done by Dr. John Sanford and Christopher Roop. This research can be found in their book titled Contested Bones. Ah, des jeux se compter. In a nutshell, they point out that there are a couple different things going on that give the evolutionary community the impression that these bones are transitional. One is that there are often artificial species that consist of a mixture of ape and human being. 
This is why they would be considered artificial, and it is often done unintentionally. The sites paleontologists would go to for their next big missing link was often scattered with fragmented bones. Consequently, bones of multiple species would be confused as one single species when in fact there were separate species, humans and apes. They are being found together at these excavation sites, intermingled. The other major issue John Sanford and Christopher Root bring to light is that the bones claiming to be transitional all show pathology. They also point out that this is a common theme found in the fossil record. There has been recent paper that corroborates this claim. So we have a couple of different claims being made here. Claims that are essentially bolstered by the authors of Contested Bones, Sanford and Roop. Fun fact, neither of these guys are actually anthropologists, or paleontologists, or zoologists. Um, Roop is actually just, he has his undergrad degree in, in biology, and Sanford is a, I think he has a doctorate actually in genetics. So naturally these two are the, the perfect candidates to study morphology and bones. Except they're not. And it really, really shows once you're reading the text itself of Contested Bones. But with their perceived expertise, Standing chugs right along and presents his two primary claims um, as to why transitional species in the human fossil record aren't actually transitional species. They're merely perceived as such. The first reason that he proposes is that the bone beds where we find uh, these, these various specimens such as uh, Homo habilis or Australopithecus sediba are actually just mixtures of various species and that the specimens we end up with are just a, an accidental mix-up of ape bones and human bones giving the illusion of a transitional species. It's essentially too perfect so it must, it must be artificial. And his second reason is that all of the specimens that we have that are considered transitional are actually pathologic in nature. They are, in essence, diseased, and that's the reason why they look the way that they do. How this squares with the artificial species claim from earlier, or the pure ape species that Standing will later reference, I'm not 100% sure. The first claim can be immediately suplexed through the table by two brazen facts of paleoanthropology. The first is that in situ photographs are taken of each and every specimen we find. In situ means the pictures are taken of the specimen still in the ground that it was found in prior to being chiseled out. Those photographs can reveal whether the animal recovered was in a jumbled mess with other animal remains or alone and clearly a single organism. And for many of our hominin species, there are lovely in-situ pictures detailing their nature as well-preserved individuals. But calling the transitional species artificial is also incorrect because it is rooted in an enormous misconception that Standing makes in this book and has been making in his videos for quite some time. When he says that species are a mixture of ape and human bones, he is not understanding what is meant by anthropologists when they say that something is mosaic, that it has ape and human features. Standing seems to think, erroneously, that a species like Homo habilis has specific structures that are ape and that are human. An ape skull but a human jaw, an ape shoulder but a human pelvis, etc, etc. But the truth of the matter is that each bone in the specimen is itself a mosaic. The skull has features that are more modern and some that are more basal. Same with the clavicle and with the shoulder. For instance, it may be long like a human, but thick like an ape. Sanford and Roop do this as well in their book, which is uh, disturbing given their education. All of the transitional forms represent mosaics of mosaics. That's the point. That's why they're so important and so special. The second claim that all of the transitional species represent pathologies in, in the human condition is based off of a single paper from Eric Trinkhouse that he links in the actual um, in the actual book right here. He shows a nice two little uh, two nice little pictures with the highlighted text. So let's investigate this and see if this paper. Let's go through the paper with one another as a team, as a duo, as pals, and see if it says what Standing needs it to say. 
Okay, so here we have the paper pulled up in this other tab. It's published in PNAS, it's a good journal. An abundance of the developmental ab or, uh, anomalies and abnormalities of the Pleistocene peoples uh, by Eric Trinkhaus from 2018. So it's a very recent paper. Very, prop very big props for that standing. We like seeing the recent papers. I think staying on top of, of the literature is like key for any kind of point that you're trying to make. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and just go through this together um, because what standing says versus you know what, what we're going to kind of see in the paper, they do clash a little bit. So very quickly, we're, we're not going to go over the significance or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's a cool paper. I recommend that you check it out. I'll put a link in the description. Starting with the abstract, what this paper does, um, and I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because you can do that on your own and, you know, you don't want to hear my voice droning on um, about it. My voice is far too nasally. Hearing my voice for that long may be detrimental to your health. Um, <laughs> but basically what this paper says is exactly what Standing says that it says, at least in the first couple of sentences that he's talking about it. Essentially, we're dealing with 75 documented anomalies or abnormalities from 66 different individuals spanning the Pleistocene, but primarily from the late Pleistocene, Middle and Upper Paleo Paleolithic, with their more complete skeletal remains. So, of course, naturally we're seeing a very heavy bias towards the more recent time period, that is to say the Middle and Upper Paleolithic. You're probably thinking to yourself, okay, can we please get some context? And I think that that's a good idea. The Paleolithic spans from about 2.1-ish million years ago to modern day. But the key thing is we're dealing with the middle to late Paleolithic, which is actually concerned with 300,000 to 30,000 years ago. So the species that we're actually dealing with are really maybe Naledi, maybe Erectus, but certainly Hedobergensis, Neanderthalensis, Sapiens, Floresiensis, um, and, and the hybrids that formed between like Denisovans. Neanderthals and humans and Neanderthals and humans and Denisovans, etc, etc. So we're dealing with a, a very healthy portion of genus Homo, but it's certainly biased towards late, which means we're not even touching with Standing's uh, sort of rescuing device here, members such as Homo habilis uh, and uh, Australopithecus sediba, uh, Robustus, Gari, um, the, the uh, Robustus and Boise are actually paranthropines, but Gari is uh, an Australopithecine. We're not dealing with, with Homo uh, rudolfensis, any of those individuals. It's very heavy bias towards the anatomically more modern and more derived. So he's not going to be able to pin uh, the, the transitional nature of some of our key links between the, quote, more ape-like morphology and more human-like uh, morphology uh, on pathology. We're, we're just not going to be able to do that. But nevertheless, it's still important to cover this because Standing likes to blame inbreeding, uh, consanguinity, consanguinity, yes, uh, for basically why we have genus Homo. He thinks that what we're dealing with, and I'll, I'll put a little picture here so that you can see, um, but he thinks we've got anatomically modern sapiens, and then degradation of that form is how we get some of the other members of genus Homo. Degradation ends in the hobbits, Homo floresiensis, it ends in Neanderthalensis, it ends in Heidelbergensis, and Naledi, and so on and so forth. Of course, this is not the case. We're, you know, uh, phylogenetically cousins with those individuals. But we'll, we'll get into that now. So basically, this, this paper uh, from the morphology and the results, um, it's an entire assessment of the sort of members, more modern members of genus Homo. Uh, to my knowledge, we're not talking about any, any members of like Homo habilis, any members of Homo rudolfensis. I don't even think we're talking about Sediba at all. I don't think Erectus is included in much of this. Um, it's mostly Neanderthals and Homo sapiens. Um, we, you can check that supplementary material for, material for yourself and double check me, but I do remember checking this a couple weeks ago, um, and that was indeed the case. So this is kind of important because Standing is highlighting something that is indeed very interesting, just not for the sake of his case. So there are a lot of abnormalities that are highlighted in this paper. Um, a lot of them, one third, are relatively common, but some of them, 26, around 27% of the abnormalities are rare, and almost 15% are really rare. So you're thinking to yourself, this is very strange. Um, why so many, why, it, it does indeed seem like we've got some, some pathologic humans chilling, chilling out um, in our, our middle to late Paleolithic era. But, as usual, things aren't as simple as Standing would like to, to make them out to be. In the book, he comments on this paper by saying, the authors of the paper point out that oftentimes these bones are found, that these bones that are found to be old are also riddled with pathology and disease. The paper also points out this fact 
um, and that the, paleo the pathology rather cannot be due to chance. There is just too much. The people that are looking for intermediate forms will typically pick up the unique bones. These are the atypical bones that hope are evidence from the ape to man story. We know these bones are actually the result of rapid and tropic decay. So what is Standing saying in essence here? He's saying that when we pick up a bone and consider it to be transitional because it looks transitional, it looks like a mosaic in and of itself, he's saying that it's only like that because of pathology. Again, this is very limiting for himself to present this particular paper because, again, it's not covering the likes of uh, Australopithecus sediba or Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis, which are some of the key transitionals. We're mostly talking about late Homo. But that's fine, we're still going to go over it. Because the most important thing is, Standing drops it right there. He takes a look at all of these abnormalities that we're finding in the fossil record, and he says, well, it's just genetic entropy, which is a creationist bu you know, buzzword. It's, it's essentially their, their hijacking of error catastrophe, something that's never been observed in nature. Um, and he's calling it a day. And then he goes on into kind of shilling and getting ready to prepare you for the rest of the book. Doesn't touch it. But he leaves out the entire discussion of the paper. And the discussion is not like short, right? It's it's a relatively like robust discussion. And it covers a lot of the issues that that Standing has mentioned and presents, surprise, surprise, some solutions for them. So we're going to go ahead and go through this discussion now together because I think it would be fun. Okay, so discussion. The elevated incidence of rare to exceptional developmental abnormalities among Pleistocene humans raises questions regarding survival, mortuary behavior, levels of stress, consanguity among the foraging populations, and possible trends throughout the Pleistocene. So the first explanation it gives is the issue of survival. It's essentially saying that what we're seeing is individuals that survived and were essentially doted on by their other members. This is because our genera, genus Homo, is partially characterized by our ability to take care of one another, um, which is why we see such a bias in sort of the, the later you get into genus Homo, you see uh, a, a higher representation of, of sort of pathology in individuals. This is true even once we get to the civil the periods of civilization, um, because while you may not have been able to survive a sprained ankle if you were like a glorified chimp, say Holanthropus genensis, uh, limping about on the savanna because your, your you know, fellow uh, sort of early apes, basal apes, didn't know how to make a splint for you to help you heal up and get along. You were left behind by the group. Such was not the case for Neanderthals and Erectus, likely, and Sapiens and sort of Heidelbergensis, all of these individuals. So you would have been able to make it to adulthood uh, healed, but, you know, still with those those uh, scars of your injuries from the past. And that's kind of what it talks about. Three quarters of individuals were mature of, of these ones with pathologies, which is very fascinating. It's essentially saying that they managed to make it late into life. It talks about how we're seeing some of the more serious disorders like hydrocephaly um, and uh, synos uh, synostosis, synostosis disorders, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Next up is it talks about, or sorry, I will read this last sentence here because I think this is, uh, this is pretty cool. Uh, the survival of the youngest individuals into early childhood may have been facilitated by maternal care, but the persistence of individuals into late juvenile or older ages with serious developmental abnormalities in both the middle and late Pleistocene implies some level of social support. So that's just super interesting in and of itself. Um, we also talk about mortuary behavior. So this, this would essentially be the idea that what we're seeing is a preferential burial of those who were deemed like biologically unique amongst these populations. Um, we've, we've seen this in human history before as well, where people with certain physical abnormalities were deemed as more beautiful or special in some way, uh, or it could have been a sort of a, a like, retribution almost as in hey i'm burying you nicely because i'm sorry you had a, a you know tough life the presence of the developmentally and degeneratively unusual individuals in european and upper paleolithic burials has suggested differing mortuary treatment of these individuals as a result of their unusual biologies among the 105 sufficiently preserved western eurasian upper paleolithic burials at least eight so 7.6 percent exhibit developmental abnormalities that would have been evident to their kin so this isn't super like this isn't a super high number but you have to consider that the mortuary behavior is probably in addition to other factors. This is a multifactorial issue, as was stated in the abstract. Unfortunately, Standing didn't take all this into account or didn't find it compelling or, or whatever. Um, so it gives the list of the, the, special, the specific individuals. It suggests that maybe we can increase this percentage of the upper Paleolithic cases to 10.4%, um, which, you know, that's not jump change. 
It talks about how formal burials were present in the Middle Paleolithic, but it's difficult to determine how many of the approximately 45 associated skeletons were from intentional burials. In any case, only three, 6.6% of possible Middle Paleolithic burials, yielded remains with marked developmental abnormalities. So of the ones that we know for sure that were buried, um, not very many of them were like pathologic in nature. Therefore, although the ner there are a number of cases of pronounced developmental abnormalities from the upper and middle Paleolithic burials, the overall percentage of externally apparent cases is sufficiently modest to make it unclear whether or not this pattern reflects the pan Pleistocene levels of unusual biologies at the time of death or differential mortuary treatment. The number of developmental abnormalities from isolated skeletal elements, along with the relative abundance of developmental abnormalities before the late early late Pleistocene advent of intentional burial, suggests the former interpretation. So let's continue onward, shall we? So for the stress, it says that the abundance of developmental abnormalities among Pleistocene humans may have been enhanced by generally high levels of stress evident among those foraging populations. After all, it can't have been easy to be living each and every day, getting up and hunting and gathering and, you know, just generally dealing with your, uh, your peers who are you know, probably a little bit violent and tensions are typically high because you don't know when you're going to eat next. Um, but this portion concludes that it is still difficult to account for more than a few of the abnormalities uh, as secondary products of stress during development. So it moves on to say, well, let's talk about inbreeding, consanguinity, this word that is difficult for me to say, but I'm getting the hang of it. It says several of these abnormalities are associated with genetic variants among extant humans, some of which are expressed or more severe through homozygosity. Other anomalies, especially dental or vertebral variants, appear to have inherited predispositions, as shown primarily through family studies. So they're basically saying, well, you know, a lot of these are genetic, and if they're not genetic, a lot of them still have predispositions that are in and of themselves genetic. So let's let's look at the DNA. Let's see what we can get uh, with regard to, to um, kind of the, the diversity in these populations. Um, and what they come to find is, I'm, I'm going to kind of skip down here so that you can, you know, get the long story short of it all. But what they come to find is that there is indeed quite a bit of inbreeding among the, the Neanderthal populations. Uh, some of this is actually what, ne uh, what Neanderthal, what Standing uh, quoted in his book. So late Pleistocene ancient human DNA, uh, ADNA, presents a similarly ambiguous picture. Three Neanderthal sequences exhibit high levels of homozygosity, implying pervasive inbreeding among their ancestors, and one Neanderthal sample has provided low levels of genetic diversity, especially among males. The Neanderthals have also been characterized as having low genetic diversity overall relative to recent humans. This is where standing stops. This, for those of you who, who don't actually uh, believe me here, it actually just stops right at that point. I don't actually know if you guys can see this because I'm not like looking at OBS, but wait, let me make sure that you can. Yes, there you go. So it actually stops right there. So let's see what it says next. However, Neanderthal DNA is known from Atlantic Europe to Siberia, and all sampled early modern humans across Eurasia, Eurasia exhibit modest levels of Neanderthal DNA, implying that there was a widespread Eurasian presence of an interconnected Neanderthal-related population, a pattern also evident morphologically. Among early modern human site-specific samples, the ADNA evidence for consanguity is equivocal with variable degrees of within-site sample diversity. Therefore, it is unclear to what extent the abundance of developmental abnormalities among the Pleistocene humans could be due to a necessarily pervasive given the wide temporal and geographical distribution of the abnormality, high level of consanguinity. So basically they're saying, we can't say that it's inbreeding. I, I butchered that sentence, but I can admit when I butcher a sentence, I'm, I'm not... This isn't something that I have memorized. I'm literally just reading it. And sometimes I don't know where the sentence is going. So have mercy on me or, you know, uh, disparage me within the comments. Both morphological and ADNA data present mixed perspectives. So by no means is inbreeding being the concluded answer here. And inbreeding is part of the necessary components for the genetic, like, entropy that creationists suppose. So this is by no means a, a for sure thing. But let's continue with the paper, because one thing that's standing left out of the book is the conclusion, and conclusions typically give us a nice summary of, of the results, um, typically going a little bit more in depth than even the abstract. So please to see trends. As is evident in Figure 2, the overwhelming majority, almost 90%, of the identified abnormalities and anomalies are late Pleistocene, with only two from the early Pleistocene and six from the middle, Pleist or six from the middle Pleistocene, my mistake. 
This contrast suggests a marked increase in the incidences later in the Pleistocene. However, before the advent of burial in the early late Pleistocene among both Neanderthals and early modern humans, reasonably well-preserved and associated postcrania are very rare. They consist basically of KNM WT 15,000 and the Dismas D. Men E. C. and Ada Puertica S. H. samples, two of which provide anomalies. Pre-late Pleistocene homo crania frequently lack bases, dentitions are rarely complete, and vertebrae are limited to the same three sites. In addition, paleopathological assessments of the middle and upper paleolithic remains have a long history, whereas only recently have similar concerns been raised with respect to the other remains, other and earlier remains. As noted above, see reference 66, differential survival of developmental and or degenerative conditions is not likely to have changed markedly during the Pleistocene. It is therefore probable that the predominance of the late Pleistocene development abnormalities is a product of paleontological preservation and focus rather than an increase of such conditions through the Pleistocene. Their conclusion is exactly the opposite of what Standing is presenting in his text. And that's just marking on the Pleistocene trends. Let us finish with the conclusion. It is apparent that Pleistocene members of genus Homo, from at least two examples in the early Pleistocene to an abundance of cases in the late Pleistocene, sustained and survived an elevated level of developmental abnormalities. Some of these developmental deficiencies are unexceptional from a recent human perspective, although finding multiple cases of them within and across samples and time periods suggest elevated levels of these more common patterns. However, one quarter of the cases are rare, some extremely so, in extant human samples, and additional one-fifth of the cases defy proper diagnosis. Only when this pattern and the associated implications of this high level of developmental abnormalities and anomalies are taken into account will it be possible to provide a comprehensive paleoanthropological assessment of human behavioral and populational processes through the Pleistocene. So essentially what they're saying is it's multifactorial. That's it. That's the whole thing. Not that it's indicative of genetic entropy, not that it's indicative of a global flood or a mitochondrial eve 6,500 to 6,000 years ago. None of that. Of course, it's very interesting that where we cut off these samples within, you know, within Stanning's book. Now, very, very shortly um, in this book, we're going to cover some of the advents of pathology in some of the hominins, very specifically Homo floresiensis. Um, and Standing is going to basically say that Homo floresiensis, who is the hobbit, is essentially the, this, this degenerate version of, of a modern human from Adam and Eve, and then the degeneration occurs post-arc, and we get all of these hominins that, you know, are, are not looking human, but they are, they, well, they're just human. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's not going to fly. Um, all of the most recent research supports the very opposite of that. Uh, and we will touch on that at length later, but I figured I'd go ahead and give you a little, a little taste of it now. First, if we look at the wiki page for mortuary archaeology, which just kind of sums it up relatively easily. But pathology is something that's easy to spot, um, even when we're looking at mineralized bone. Pathology is looking is looking skeletal markers, looking at skeletal markers to understand diseases, nutrition, and the evolution of certain diseases in order to understand diseases today. The osteological paradox also helps researchers understand health among populations. It was invented by James Wood in 1992, saying that there are three types of situations when it comes to pathological markers on bone. The first is that an individual was so unhealthy that when that particular disease was contracted, they die before it has a chance to leave lesions. Then you have healthier individuals who have the disease and were able to fight it up, fight it off rather, but not before the legions formed. Um, and the last is the individuals that don't become sick and die from other causes. Uh, pathology is not only due to illnesses or diseases. It can be caused by nutritional deficiencies, which are during growth and development, um, and, you know, genetic things of the like. But the, basically this page just covers like how we know what we know. The, the whole concept of mortuary archaeology is like a pretty well-known thing. Um, because we share a lot of the same pathologies with our very close ancestors, and you can track this all the way back through time. But specifically with Homo floresiensis, who is the classic, the classic member of our genus who gets pinned with, uh, it's just a human with pathology, um, the hobbit, it's a very, very cool, actually, uh, <laughs> hominin, very cute. But they address the pathological hypothesis in depth, uh, and interestingly enough, we will look at the paper specifically momentarily. 
In contrast to two evolutionary hypotheses, a third theory has been advanced, that the Flores remains represent modern humans suffering from some type of pathological condition. The initial suggestion was that LB1 was a modern human that suffered from microcephaly, a condition in which the neurocranium is considerably smaller than that of normal healthy people. This can be the result of a genetic disorder whose main symptoms are the underdevelopment of the brain and overlying cranial vault, a condition known as primary microcephaly, talks about microcephaly, etc., etc. Um, and then, here's, here's an example right here. This is the LB1 cranium in the center, compared with a modern human with endemic hypothyroidism to the left, and a modern human showing microcephaly to the right. And what they have to say, right down here. Dang it, I'm not going to find it. I'm going to ruin my whole punchiness. Um, let's see. Despite superficial similarities due to a small neurocranium relative to the face of both LB1 and the microcephalic modern human, the midline profile of the neurocranium and the facial skeleton differ among them. The photograph of the human with endemic hypothyroidism was mirrored for easier comparison with the other photograph. So what they essentially conclude here, when and they link the study that we're going to look at in a, in a moment, is that uh, microcephaly and basically pathology in humans is not uh, a viable assessment. Uh, let's see here. While the skeletons of both human cretins uh, and Homo floresiensis differ only or differ from that of healthy modern humans, they do not resemble one another. For example, the limb proportions of LB1 are not comparable to those humans with cretinism, i.e., microcephaly. Then they they look at Laren syndrome as well. But the LV1 skull shows the opposite pattern: the forehead slants backward rather than rather than protruding. The face is large relative to the rest of the skull. Um, so basically, the conclusions are that no. This is indeed a species, but fortunately we can go and look at the original study, which is what good scientists do. And we can see for ourselves what exactly uh, was, was said about LB1 in this particular study, which was in 2016. So this is probably the most recent study, at least on microcephaly with regard to Homo floresiensis. The only reason I say that because that's what I remember. But let's go ahead and, and consider the abstract for a moment. We're not going to go too in-depth on this because this is pretty non-debated. Um, but basically, all the microcephalic skulls here, analyzed here, share the derived condition of anatomically modern sapiens. Cranial vault thickness does not, does not help to clarify the definition of the species of Homo floresiensis, but it also does not support the attribution of LB1 to Homo sapiens. We conclude that there is no support for the attribution of LB1 to Homo sapiens, as there is no evidence for systematic pathology because it does not have any of the amorphic traits of our species. And we're going to do this for as many hominids as we have to do it for. Uh, but in, in lieu of having actual DNA from specimens, morphology is indeed what we go off of. Uh, and we can tell pathology from just a classic, regular, weird-looking skull. Uh, creationists like to show this classic picture of a wrestler with like a tapered cranial vault that looks kind of pointed at the top. But the problem... Oh, well, maybe we can look at it. Um, humans with pinheads? I don't even know if that's... Well, microcephaly, look, there it is. Okay, this, I don't think this is an excellent example. I was looking for a wrestler. Um, but either way, humans that have microcephaly, uh, these kinds of genetic disorders, can actually be, like, clocked with those disorders, even post-mortem, um, because they leave various scars that, that like, give away their pathology, that a healthy skull, even a healthy skull that's developed to be much smaller, such as in a different species, wouldn't have. This would be like looking at the difference between a rat skull and a mouse skull and looking at the mouse skull and saying, ah, well, that mouse skull is just a rat skull with microcephaly. Well, no, it's not. It lacks the pathology that a rat skull with microcephaly would have. It's, it's a healthy skull. It's just smaller and it has its own unique elements to it. Um, so yes, I think we'll go ahead and, and finish off this stream uh, very shortly. So with that long science out of the way, let's go ahead and finish off this chapter because it might shock you to learn that that is the end of the chapter. This chapter is comprised of three pages. Page number one, page number two, page number, I guess four pages, four pages. Um, but let's finish it, shall we? The author of this paper, the one we just went over, the first one, the long one, the very grueling one, not the second one, 
points out that oftentimes these bones that are found to be old are often riddled with pathology and disease. This paper also points out that the fact that this pathology also points out the fact that this pathology cannot be due to chance. There is just too much. The people that are looking for intermediate forms will typically pick up the unique bones. There are the atypical bones they hope for, they hope are evidence for their ape to man story. We know these bones are actually the result of rapid entropic decay. That's that error catastrophe or genetic entropy that they're talking about. It may appear redundant at times, but this is done intentionally in order to really showcase just how fatal the evidence is to human evolution. This book consists of the most up-to-date evidence against human evolution, which is why I plan to hammer down on these significant points. So put on your seatbelts because we are going for a ride. Genetic similarities, chromosome 2 fusion, ERVs, and other classes of retrotransposons, the fossil record dating methods, Lucy and the Australopithecines, plus more will be covered in this handbook on human evolution. That's the end of the chapter. So what do we think? What are our first impressions of the chat of this uh, of this text of this series? Please let me know below. If it's too nerdy and scientific, please complain below. Or I don't know, thumbs down the video. Please don't thumbs down the video. Makes me really sad when I see the thumbs downs. So what can we conclude from this first chapter? Well, there's a lot of appeals to authority, um, and the appeals to authority are very, very much in a microcosm, right? It's okay to appeal to the authorities who wrote this book, neither of which are paleoanthropologists or paleontologists or archaeologists or anatomists, uh, but it's not okay for us as members of the conventional scientific community to look to, to the plethora of experts who know these fossils, who know these forms inside and out, and say, well, maybe they Maybe they just might know what they're talking about. Maybe there's something to the, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours combined that went into their doctorates. Um, I think that Standing has kind of shown his hand a little in this first chapter. He's presented a paper that we have systematically gone through and shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that it does not say what he wants it to say. In fact, it explicitly says that it's not saying that. It explicitly says that this cannot be something that is uh, attributed solely to inbreeding in order to validate his error catastrophe hypothesis. But moreover, what we found out um, is that what we're dealing with here is a text that is going to be making very bold claims and then presenting very few uh, methods of support, methodologies, uh, studies, projects, whatever, to, to actually back it up. The, the evidence is being presented as the most up-to-date, the best, the most perfect. Um, and I can tell you as someone who's already read through this and, and indeed has annotated uh, the entire thing, if you can't see all my annotations, um, that what we're, not, what we're dealing with isn't that. We're not dealing with, with the, uh, on the origin of species 2.0. Um, and that's not meant to disparage necessarily Standing's character, just him and Ramat's work with regard to sourcing and supporting their claims. We will continue with chapter two shortly, uh, but for the time being, it seems to me uh, that we can sum it up like so. One, Ramat has seemingly faked a paper being published in PLOS 1. Two, transitional species are composed of individual bones that are themselves mosaics. They are also recorded in situ, as in jumbling cannot be used as a catch-all rescuing device. Three, pathology is limited to late genus Homo and is likely multifactorial, survival shared bias, plus preferential burial, plus stress, plus inbreeding. And four, Homo floresiensis is not pathologic in nature. I'll see you next time, my gentle and modern apes, in the Library of Errors. Today's Sapien Spotlight goes out to Vendalian1998, who is a friend of the channel and has excellent conversations. Check them out with the link in the description.